This is the Workplace Podcast with your host, William Corliss, brought to you in association with Yellowwood, providers of executive coaching, corporate training and facilitation, your external learning and development partner. Each week, we focus on a different aspect of the workplace. We hear from guest speakers who are subject matter experts and are incredibly talented at what they do. These experts will give you a different perspective and insight to work life with the aim of empowering you to take a different path to success in all aspects of work life. These perspectives will include career and personal success, leadership, high performance teams and creating a better work life culture in your organization. Yellowwood, take a different path to success with your career, team and organization. Welcome to the Workplace Podcast and our topic today is trust yourself. Stop overthinking and channel your emotions for success at work. And joining us today on the Workplace Podcast is Melody Wilding. Melody is a best-selling author of Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking and Challenge Your Emotions for Success at Work. Named one of Business Insider's most innovative coaches for her groundbreaking work on sensitive strivers. Her clients include CEOs, C-level executives and managers at top Fortune 500 companies such as Google, Amazon and JP Morgan, amongst others. Melody is featured in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and is a contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, Psychology Today and Forbes. Melody is a licensed social worker with a master's from Columbia University and a professor of human behavior at Hunter College. Melody, very welcome to the Workplace Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you. I am thrilled and a hearty congratulations. You got married on Friday. That's right. That's right. We are, what, 72 hours out from uh, from the nuptials. Wow. So thank you so much for your time. And I know your time is precious. So I want to talk about this book. I think this will be a precious gift for our listeners today. It really struck a chord with me, this book, and I'm sure it will strike a chord with our listeners too. Well-renowned author Susan Cain has said this, it is groundbreaking and insightful. Trust yourself is essential reading for every sensitive introverted professional. Wow, what a compliment. So well, well done on that. So how I find this book, you tell your own personal stories, stories of your clients, how to get unstuck. You have so many resources. You talk about your board of directors. You have reflection questions. This book has the balance right. I have to congratulate you on your writing style. Everything about this is it's it's a really accessible book. So um, I'm so excited uh, to talk about this. So uh, the lens that we're going to look at this is perfectionism and boundaries at work and what I liked about your book is how you share your own struggles. And y- you said in the book about being guilty about taking time off, which lots of our listeners will connect with. And then you note, everybody else seems so together. What is wrong with me? Yeah. So tell me, mm-hmm. tell me about the, the this book about being a perfectionist, because you talk about sensitive strivers. What's a a sensitive striver. A sensitive striver is someone who is highly sensitive, meaning they are genetically wired to think and feel everything more deeply. So these are people that actually have different neurochemicals, have different areas of their brain that light up more in relation to processing information, decision making, uh, deep thought, connecting ideas. So these are people who are very kind, they're compassionate, they're very aware of their own emotions as well as other people. But because they are so hyper attuned to the environment and themselves, that can also lead them to overthinking, to being overly harsh on themselves because they're so self-aware of their own shortcomings, as well as comparing themselves to other people's behavior. And so we have the high sensitivity piece, but we also have the high achieving piece. And so in my story, I talk a lot about how I was that sort of classic gold star 
A plus kid striving to do well in, in everything. And that carried over into my adult life. So that is where a lot of this perfectionism stems from, is this not necessarily even a desire for flawlessness, but really this overemphasizing our weaknesses and downplaying our strengths. I really identify with this. So when I started off in this career as a coach, I was very highly tuned. It's such a great quality of mine. And as you, I, I can identify with you. And then it was every time I was reading this book, I was going, oh, I can see myself. I can see myself. And then you have a checklist of all these things of how we can recognize ourselves. Um, so we're not going to go through the, the full checklist. So it's it's in the book. Um, but can you give us an example of how I might recognize if I am a, a sensitive striver? Of course. So if you are someone who feels like you experience your emotions to a higher level of depth and complexity than other people around you, if you are someone who needs time to think through decisions before you act, if you're someone who has a very overactive inner critic that never takes a day off, mm. if you find it difficult to set boundaries, you put other people's needs ahead of your own because you're so vigilant to other people's behaviors. Um, and one uh, last way I see it is struggling to turn off your mind. So you yeah. may ruminate about events, events, you may replay things, you may do what I call future tripping and worrying about things that haven't even happened yet. I think a lot of people will identify with these things, especially with work. And the pandemic then has really... I, I suppose, exacerbated things because we find it even harder now to switch off from work because the flexibility, we're, you know, mobile phones, all these different things are going on. So you talked about the neuroscience there. So part of this is how you're framing it for people. It's, it's not uh, nurture, it's more nature. It's that neuroscience. And in the book, you talk about the SPS, the, the genetic gift. So just just talk to us a little bit about that sensory processing sensitivity. You, you know, how does that show up physically? You know, what's the neuroscience behind it? Most of us, I think if we consider ourselves sensitive people, at least for a long time, I felt that this was a, a defect of mine, that I needed to be tougher. I needed to grow a thicker skin. And when I came across the research about high sensitivity, it opened up a whole new world of understanding for me to realize that this is not just a choice or a weakness in you. This is an actual biological trait and you referred to SPS. So sensory processing sensitivity is what the trait is called in the research. And what researchers have found is that it exists in about 15 to 20% of the population that these people have a genetic uh, pattern where they have a more active nervous system. And this is not just pop psychology. This has been proven out in 30, 50 years of research. And what's really fascinating is that in more, more recent years, as, as brain imaging has advanced, what we find is that people with this SPS have different brain patterning. So the way our brains process certain neurochemicals, things like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine is different than the rest of the population because we're, we're processing more. And not only that, we have what's called more active mirror neurons. So that is our empathy neuron, our neurons that help us perceive, observe, and model other people's behaviors and be aware of their emotional states. And so it's not necessarily that we have more neurons, we have the same number, but ours are more active. So they literally light up more when we see other people. Or, you know, if you've ever encountered a, a colleague or a direct report who's struggling, your mirror neurons are lighting up much more, which is why you're more able to empathize with that person. Which is a huge strength for coaches because uh, you can really tune into what's going on or there's something missing here. So it, it's that good instinct isn't that that you're kind of going, it's a, uh, excuse me for this reference, your your spider senses are tingling, <laughs> is, isn't it? 100%. I call it your sensitive striver, sixth sense. 
which is that that intuition, like you said, that we have this almost superhuman ability to recognize what people are going through or to read between the lines before somebody else has even said a word. And not only that, we of course, we have the feeling side, which is beneficial as, as a coach, but also as a leader in terms of relationship building, influence, right? And being able to do that authentically. Not only that, but this trait of high sensitivity evolved through, you know, eons because it was beneficial. It was beneficial to have someone in the group who was more cautious, who thought things through before they acted. So if you think about cave person times, it was very helpful to have someone who was more sensitive, who was observing what was happening in the surroundings, looking out for danger before just running out there for food. That was the type of person that kept everyone in the tribe safe which is why this trait of high sensitivity still persists today. So it makes us great decision makers. It actually makes us really wise risk takers because we're, we go into risks with eyes wide open. (laughs) We're aware of everything that could go wrong, but we're also sensing and looking out for opportunities that other people may not see and making those connections before other people do, which can obviously be be a great uh, advantage. And it is very reassuring and heartwarming to know I am not the only one if I am listing in 15 to 20 percent of the population is quite significant. So when that translates into the workforce, you know, sometimes there's a cultural thing where it's you're just fragile or you're vulnerable or you're soft and it's kind of seen as a negative. And it's great to see that there's so many strengths and qualities to that. Really, the question is, is how do we manage that, isn't it? Exactly. You know, I think for so many of us, like like I said, we we downplay these strengths. We beat ourselves up for having them. We try to be someone we're not all of which leads to self-recrimination and and self-doubt and imposter syndrome, right? It drains our energy. It causes burnout. And not only that, then we're not bringing those gifts to our workplaces and our teams when, especially in, in times like we are now where uncertainty, incivility, morale, all of these things are at an all time low. We need people who are sensitive strivers to really be stepping up to have those type of people in the best seats. And that's the thing about confidence. It it is about not trying to be tough when you're not. It's actually, how about I play to my strengths? And here are my strengths here. And here's, when it comes to confidence, then it's really about accepting who you are rather than trying to fit into somebody else's perception of what you should be. What are your thoughts on that? 100%. I couldn't agree more that most of the time, true confidence is very understated and Mm. quiet, right? It's being able to set boundaries, be assertive about your beliefs and and what you stand for. But that doesn't mean that you need to be aggressive about that, right? It means recognizing that there can be win-wins here. I can win and you can win. It doesn't have to be either or. And that gets back to this perfectionism mindset where perfectionism really tricks you into thinking things need to be black or white, either or. We think very much in extremes. So often when when clients come to me, confidence is the biggest thing they struggle with. And they'll say, well, I'm almost nervous to become confident because I don't want to be big headed. I don't want to be like those, those people I dislike who are just political operators will step over everyone to get ahead. So we immediately go to this other side of the spectrum, but true healthy confidence is in between. It's being able to acknowledge and amplify your strengths while having the, uh, being humble enough to recognize and work on your weaknesses where appropriate. And I think there's a lot to be said for clarity on boundaries and clarity on your strengths and what value you bring as well. So a lot of times when I'm working with clients, it's it's very much that of we tend to overcompensate to go, I would never dream of being that dominant person. And yet when we do the opposite of that, then we're very much submissive or maybe taken advantage of. Would you agree? 
100%, you know, as especially as sensitive people, we are kind, caring, sometimes to a fault. <laughs> and many times we overextend ourselves because we want people to like us. <laughs> we we want people to think highly of us. And we think, well, if I'm just helpful and I say yes to everything, then they'll like me. But this ends up backfiring because when you're burned out, when you're exhausted and depleted, you end up becoming resentful of other people, right? And and you're not bringing your best to anything that you're doing. You are basically speaking about my whole life uh, before I discovered self-development. And our listeners then, this is where that achievement addiction comes in with the perfectionism and people pleasing and over-functioning. And I think these are key facets then to understand about ourselves to say, oh, we need to recognize this to say, actually, this is where we actually can get control over that and get the balance right. Can you tell us, a, so achievement addiction, what does that look like? This was something I not only observed in my clients, but realized I had myself. And so it's it can look like being very fixated on goal setting. You feel like if you don't have a target that you're moving towards, you're not worthy. You're, you're worthless without that. Anything less than the absolute best is not good enough. So it's striving for that A plus in everything you do. And anything less than that is a failure. It's seeming like there's only one right way to do something. And that any if you don't get that, then you're not doing it right. Craving those gold stars, that validation from other people and that praise in anything that you do. Beating yourself up for making mistakes. So all of this achievement addiction, I call the honor roll hangover. <laughs> and that comes about because usually this sort of honor roll student mindset of get the good grades, go to a good school, be a good boy or girl, and end result, make other people happy. That mentality tends to follow us into our careers where we're striving for that proverbial A plus and gold star in everything that we do. And so the honor roll hangover, much like you know, a real hangover, <laughs> can cause a lot of doubt and uncertainty and fatigue. And it's made up of three elements. We, we mentioned two of them. So the first is that perfectionism. So that is that feeling like you have to prove yourself in everything that you do, endlessly beating yourself up for making mistakes, Feel like feeling like you have to be shiny and impeccable on the outside no one can see you sweat. So that's the first part. It's perfectionism. Second, we have people pleasing. We've touched on this a little bit with that idea of saying yes too much, um, not having great boundaries, but people pleasing is fundamentally about having higher regard for other people's opinions and perceptions and less of your own, right? So you, you think and you act in ways that may compromise what's most important to you. And then last, closely related to both of the above, is over-functioning. This is a big one. This is probably the sneakiest one of all. Yeah. And this is when you chronically fix and rescue other people. And again, this can masquerade as being helpful. You know, you're, you're the leader, you take initiative. But where it gets sneaky is that when you over-function, when you take on more responsibility than you should, it can create a dynamic where other people are allowed to underfunction. So this can happen in families, but I see this happen in teams all the time. When one person or one leader is the one who swoops in to fix everything, to pick up the pieces last minute, and then other people don't have to step up. So it can be extremely frustrating for you, but it also leads to this dynamic where other people are not growing and taking accountability in the way that they should. I was only talking to a client last week on this and they go into a meeting and there's this silence when actions are being delegated out and the silence is held and that person then doesn't want to let people down, the people pleasing, they are over-functioning and they go, okay, I'll do it. And then because, as you said, this dynamic appears, it creates this sense of frustration going, why always me? 
And does that perfectionism comes in then because you don't want to drop the ball? And then you're doing it to service to them because you're you're that it's it's a vicious circle, isn't it? It just goes on and on again. And I'm going to talk about boundaries for for a minute, but sometimes it's there's it's that aspect of permission seeking as well. It's it's like, can I do this? So there's something about owning that power because it's linked to boundaries as well, isn't it? It's like, actually, I do have a right and responsibility to my own self-care or I do have a right responsibility to switch off or I can say no. So can you tell me a little bit about the permission seeking there? Yeah, so many of us as as sensitive strivers, I, I think because we feel insecure as we are, we look to others to tell us we're okay and to validate ourselves. And again, this can show up in very insidious ways. So one way I tend to see it show up a lot is polling other people. So if you have a decision to make, you go out and ask every single person on your team, you're asking Uber drivers, your spouse, everyone, what do you think I should do? Instead of forming your own judgments about a situation. So you're really outsourcing your decision-making to other people. And many times this comes from a place of, of insecurity and, mm. and the, the people pleasing, you know, you tell me what's best for me because I don't know what's best for myself. So that's one big way I see it come up as well as undermining ourselves in our language. Many times this, this shows up very clearly where we say, oh, I don't know if this is a good idea or this is probably silly or even if we make a request, we immediately throw ourselves under the bus. We make a request and say, oh, but you know, if you're too busy, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it myself, right? And so we inadvertently undermine ourselves. And that brings us to the topic of your book. It really is about trusting yourself. And I, I, I just got to read this because it is about is sometimes we talk about boundaries and this is what happens in, in perfectionism as well. And this is actually a sample of the book that I actually sent to a client just thinking of you. And I, I love this. And we're going to talk about boundaries now. Boundaries create space between you and another entity, acting like a fence that controls what influences you, what you let in or keep out and how you choose to respond when someone passes those limits. And then it goes on to say, I've attended, we have a tendency to be influenced by others' reactions and problems. So we put others, people's needs and desires ahead of your own. So those boundaries then, what, what do they look like at work? Like, how do I know I've, I've weak boundaries that now are porous boundaries, if you want to call it that? That's right. So, yes, as, as you said, or we're alluding to, boundaries exist on the spectrum. So think about where we want to land is sort of that healthy Goldilocks in the middle, but there's two extremes. So you could have very rigid boundaries, which means you're inflexible. You may have certain standards or demands and you don't budge on that. And I'm sure we've all encountered people like that. Now on the other end, and what sensitive strivers tend to struggle with more is porous boundaries where you are so overly flexible that you can be taken advantage of. And so at work, this can show up in so many different ways. It can show up externally in how we manage our time, our calendars, uh, what projects we say yes to, how we allow people to communicate with us or not communicate with us. But then there's also internal boundaries. And one of the biggest ways that tends to manifest is with feedback. You know, how long do you, you allow something to take up mental and emotional energy within you? Or when do you, how do you healthy in a healthy way, compartmentalize something so that it doesn't keep impacting you mentally and emotionally. So I think that's important because many times we just think as boundaries as something that's very tangible and we don't acknowledge that we also need those those internal intangible limits as well. And this is something I had to do personally a lot of work on. And sometimes it comes to boundaries is you need to know, well, where can I have boundaries? 
uh, as well and wh- what do they look like so how you communicate or um, people calling you you know during your summer holidays or, or a vacation if you want to call it that um, and again when it comes to boundaries sometimes it's actually giving people feedback or communicating that say actually this is not acceptable so there's a there is a sense of responsibility then to communicate these these boundaries is that something that you would work with with your clients on 100% yes we we work all the way from detecting where you need boundaries which i think is a major step all the way to communicating them but then also don't forget we have to follow up on our boundaries and we need yeah. we need to make sure we hold ourselves accountable to following through on them because I always say you teach people how to treat you and you need to teach people to treat you with respect. But if we set a boundary, let's say you, you set a boundary that you're going to end work at a certain time and you don't follow through on that, you continue working until 8 PM, 9 PM at night when you said you were going to end at six. Well, you're teaching people that your boundaries are not that important. So the next time you say, oh, I can't do this, someone may say, well, sure you can. And you may more readily give in. So it's really important that we're, we don't think of boundaries just as something we do in that one moment, but it's an entire process of recognizing the situations where we need to set them, prioritizing those which are more important because you you can't and probably shouldn't set boundaries everywhere. You'll become way too rigid but that also we need to follow through to hold ourselves accountable and to enforce limits or consequences when other people don't meet our boundaries, even when we've, uh, when we've communicated them clearly. And it's a form of self-sabotage. So you, you have to hold yourself accountable. If I send this email out now, what signal is that sending about my boundary? And again, it goes back to permission seeking. That actually steals your power. And sometimes what Irish people might do, and it's a cultural thing, is they might um, say sorry first. Or, sorry, I have to tell you about my boundary. You know, and that minimizes our power or discounts what we're doing. And then people go, well, they, you know, it it lessens the message or the impact of that, isn't it? Or they're going, oh, it's not a real boundary. You know, they're they're seeking permission. What what are your thoughts on that? Is that a, a is that a culture thing or is that a, a sensitive striver thing or both? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. I think I think it's definitely cultural. I think there's gender dynamics as well. You know, I see this much more among women who are just apologetic about existing, <laughs> right? Um, and so. Yes, th- this idea of saying sorry, prefacing everything, even when it's not something you need to be sorry about, there is a time and place to apologize. If you have made a mistake, if you have stepped on somebody else's toes, it's probably perfectly appropriate to apologize. But if we are overdoing it, it's usually a sign that we don't feel safe to be as we are, that we have to. Uh, apologize for existing, for taking up space, for thinking that we are not entitled to respecting our own time, energy, what have you. And so even just cutting that out of your vocabulary, and this takes some conscious effort, but if you just spend one week noticing how often you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late, become aware of when that habit comes out because it almost becomes a verbal crutch that you say it. But then you can make the very simple switch to use thank you instead. Instead of, I'm sorry I made you wait, thank you so much for your patience. Or I'm sorry I have to decline, thank you so much for thinking of me and for this invitation. And it feels much better. It feels like you're coming from more of a place of of strength. And for the other person, it comes from a place of gratitude. And that's the best thing about this book. There are so many resources like that in the book. And a, a part of, of permission seeking and over apologizing, and this is something I would do as well, a, a habit, is over explaining. This is the reason I have to give you the boundary, you know, and this is why. So tell us a little bit about over explaining. How does that show up or as a, in the sensitive striver? 
Oh yes. Over explaining, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't do this. My kids are sick and it's a really busy time. And, and we go on and on and on. When we feel uncomfortable, we tend to over explain and we feel like we are not allowed to just state a boundary. So we have to justify it. Right. But not only can this signal to the other person that you are insecure and not confident in setting that boundary, it opens you up to objection handling. When someone else can say, oh, well, here's a workaround for that, or we could take this off of your plate. Instead of you just saying, I'm not able to do that. Thank you so much for thinking of me, perhaps in the future, right? And being very succinct. So it's important to remember that fewer words strengthen your message, whether it is is giving a boundary or it is speaking up in a meeting, fewer words strengthen your message and more words tend to dilute it. And that's the work, isn't it? If we use so few words as a sensitive striver, we're probably thinking, oh gosh, that sounds so rude. Where actually you're protecting yourself from objection handling, which is wonderful. And again, about the book, then you use the strive framework to get the balance right. So strive is sensitivity, thoughtfulness, responsibility, inner drive and vigilance. Emotionality. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And so talk us through that. So how do we get the balance right? And because you have a way of measuring if if I have a good balance or if it's out of kilter a little bit. So just talk us through the strive framework. Yeah, the Stripe Diagnostic and the Stripe Framework came about because as I was working with people, everyone would come to me and say, I just feel so overwhelmed. I have so many areas where I feel like I'm struggling. Perfectionism, people pleasing, overthinking, um, uh, emotional overstimulation, uh, trouble speaking up, What? and they would not know where to start. And so in writing the book, I developed this framework because I noticed there were some predictable patterns in a few key qualities that these people had, and that if we could dimensionalize them, and if a person could assess themselves on these different dimensions, then we knew what areas we needed to prioritize. And so that's where the Strive came work, framework came from. So sensitivity is really refers to that nervous system response. So being uh, observant of what's happening around you, but being very easily overwhelmed. Thoughtfulness is being a very deep thinker, but on the flip side, overthinking. Uh, Let's see, R is responsibility, being loyal, dedicated, but sometimes being a people pleaser, inner drive, having a, a large desire for growth, but sometimes overdoing that. Vigilance, being attuned to the surroundings, but sometimes too aware of other people's needs and emotionality, feeling all things in a big way, both positive and negative. So as you can tell, as I'm describing them, they all have a strength side and a shadow side. And many of us, because we were never uh, taught that we have this personality type, we don't have tools to handle it. We find ourselves more in the shadow side of and what I call an unbalanced sensitive striver. And so the framework walks you through a set of questions, a diagnostic to rate yourself on each area so that you get some quantitative data about where am I right now? What's what's the state of my affairs and where do I want to be? So identifying what I call your growth gap. So let's say right now you're a two on emotionality, which would be fairly unbalanced. You want to be at a six. That allows you to ask yourself, well, what would what would I look like if I was at a six on emotionality? What would be different for me? And what does that mean about what I need to do to get there? Um, so I find it's it helps reduce uncertainty for people. It helps bring order to the internal chaos that uh, that being a sensitive driver can can feel like. I like that it's a personality type and that I can rate myself in this. And then if I was working with a coach like yourself or with uh, a leader, or if I see somebody within my team that I think is a sensitive striver, this is someone that I could give feedback on to say, well, could you self-rate yourself and here's the gap and what's the difference between 
your self-perception and my perception. And it's a wonderful tool then to help develop people. I, I was I was so impressed with this. And this really helps with talent retention at the moment because there's so much burnout going on that these are the people who really feel like they're being overstretched right now. Then they're getting resentful. Then it's the, the quiet quitting that's going on and they're kind of going, I cannot believe that I'm not valued here where they might have some contribution to this by having weak boundaries, not placing enough value on themselves. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a reality check as well to say, well, how did I contribute to the situation? And some people listening in here, in here, that might be a hard thing to digest. What are your thoughts on that? Is 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 this a, an eye opener for people when when you, you introduce this framework? It, it usually is. It usually is. And it's usually very um, calming to people because like you said, they've realized, wow, I thought I was the only person who struggled with all of these things. And I'm not. It doesn't mean I'm broken. It doesn't mean I'm deficient, but it, they can look at it more objectively to say, oh, I have these areas where I need to improve but it feels much more manageable and achievable rather than a mystery to people. And I just want to go back to one thing you said, because you were talking about retention and yes, people are exhausted, burned out. What I think workplaces are also being turned on to is that neurodiversity is something we need to be looking more closely at that everyone on our teams doesn't think and process and approach work in the same way. And for sensitive strivers, that, that's absolutely true. We need more time to process. So if you have meetings where you are constantly putting people on the spot and you're saying, hey, what do you think? Without any time to deliberate or, about what you want to share or no opportunity to follow up with additional thoughts, you're going to lose out on a lot of insights from those people. And same thing, being considerate about how you give feedback, not that you have to have kid gloves, but that you want to reduce uncertainty. You want to give people a heads up. Hey, I would like to talk about some of your uh, performance metrics today. Can you please come prepared with X, Y, and Z? So it's these little shifts of recognizing that we need to embrace neurodiversity. We need to make space for people that think differently on our teams and also embrace that and, and see it as the strength that it, that it is. I might play the devil's advocate here. I am listing in here and you two people are just a bunch of softies, you know, and this is just mumbo jumbo. And you mentioned about incivility and mm. I'm just going to go just get on with it. Just grow a thick skin. Why can't <laughs> you just do that? Melody, you know, it, this is your problem, not mine. I I would say to that person, I hear you, but the truth of how business gets done and how the workplace works is people and emotions, and we can't separate the two. And if you have someone on your team who is a sensitive striver, who is someone who is skilled because they can empathize, because they can sense other people's emotions. They're a more effective influencer, negotiator, problem solver. And so, like I said, this doesn't mean we need to be soft. We need to hold people accountable. We need to be assertive in getting things done, but we can do so with humanity. And I think that's what sensitive people bring to the table is they recognize the human element in the work while balancing that with their striver side of, okay, we need to get things done here, but how do we bring those two things together that rather than make them at odds? So is it more about acceptable standards of expectation and to here's what's healthy for your well-being, here's what your needs are, and here's what the team and organization needs are, and here's what we need to set goals on. So this is where your your framework then would, would fit in to say, actually, this is what a healthy workplace would look like. And this is what success means for you in your role. I think that's one way to think about it. Um, 
you know, I, whenever I often work with clients, I have them create something I call a me manual, which is a guide to you as a professional. And as a sensitive striver, this is very important for you to create so that people understand what do you like at your best? What brings out your best? What do you look like at your worst? How do you best make decisions? How should someone, what's the best way to give you feedback? How, when, and, and on what? So it covers all of these quote unquote soft skills or these communication topics that if left unsaid can cause a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and hurt feelings, not just for you, but for other people as well. So it shows a lot of confidence to put that out there to say, hey, here's how you get the best out of me. How does this work? How do we make this work for both of our personalities? So I have plenty of clients who are sensitive strivers who tend to be, like I said, people who take a bit more time to make decisions. They like more context, more details, and they work with someone who is exactly the opposite, who is a very dominant personality, who makes quick decisions, doesn't want a lot of detail, really only cares about the outcomes and not the people involved. And those are very important things to be aware of so that you can figure out where can I tweak my style, not compromise myself to become inauthentic, but where can I flex my style to be able to work best with that other person and get the results we need to uh, rather than being inauthentic to myself. I love that notion of the me manual. This is something I sometimes do with teams. It's it's those instruction manual handle with care. So if you have something that's really precious like silk, you're not going to fire it into the, the washing machine. You know, you'd follow the the those instructions uh, there. Those uh, And I think that's wonderful. And another part of the book that, and again, I want to tell this for our listeners, there's so many strategies, reflection questions, real life examples, how to get unstuck. And one of the exercises that you have is your inner board of directors. If you're inner critic, inner protector, inner rebel, inner champion, inner achiever. Can you tell us about that? Because I think this is a wonderful concept and a wonderful exercise. How might you use that exercise and why have um, those inner board of directors? This exercise came about because my background is as a therapist. And there is one school of therapy called internal family systems. A part of internal family systems is recognizing that within us, we all have different parts. We have the self-sabotaging part, the inner critic. We have an inner champion or a wise parent. We may have the fun-loving part of ourselves. And so when we face a decision, those different parts of ourselves may feel at odds. and. You know, if if you have ever faced a decision and you say, well, one part of me wants this, but another part of me wants that. That's a great example of that. And so this exercise your inner board of directors is based on this idea that we all have this sort of proverbial board of directors in our minds or in our hearts with these different personalities that when we're facing a tough decision or uncertainty, we can tap into those different parts of ourselves and be most conscious about which one do I want to bring forward here. There may be times where you need to let your very practical side take the reins. There may be times where that more spontaneous, fun-loving side is the one that you want to lead. So this is really about engaging consciously and tuning into that intuition, which isn't always just one thing. You talk about ambition as well. And I like this whole notion of there's a strength and a shadow. There is something about when we're setting goals and we're setting ambitions. And some people after this you know, podcast might be set a goal, but there's a dark side to that ambition as well. And this is something I really struggled with as well. Um, as a sensitive striver, I have to say, I, I, I cannot recommend your book enough to our listeners. So I, I we're going to finish up on this is that dark side of ambition. If I'm the type of person who's constantly setting goals or when I do set a goal, then I might move the goalposts. 
a little bit of, oh, this wasn't good enough or whatever. What, what advice might you give to me, you know, if I'm a quite ambitious person? Yeah. You know, we are recording this towards the end of the year. And so I think what's top of mind for a lot of people is is we're we're thinking ahead to the next year and and us instead of strivers, we always tend to be thinking about what's next for me. But what we don't do as often is give up goals. <laughs> we just keep accumulating goals until we're trying to do 10,000 different things and we're pulled so thin that we're not doing anything well. And then we beat ourselves up for that. And the cycle goes round and round and round. So I really encourage everyone to practice zero-based goal setting. So just like zero-based accounting, where you start with nothing and you add expenses back in, same thing here. If you had to reset all, all of your goals tomorrow, what would stick around? What is outdated? What no longer serves you? What is a ambition that someone else had for you that is not really something that you want to keep following along with anymore? But this can be very helpful because you need to say no to certain things to say yes to what is really going to serve you. And I'll give our listeners an example here. I had an ambition to do a weekly podcast. And I realized I put myself under pressure to read a book a week, to do the prep for that, to produce it, to contact people. Then I have to do my own job. And I'm like, I'm the person in charge of the podcast. How about I cut it back to two a month? Or sometimes every three weeks, and that's fine too. So I think there is a great learnings in that. And thank you so much for your time today. So Melody, if people were to get in contact with you, if they were to find out more about your book, your courses, to engage in your services, how might they do so? You can reach me at melodywilding.com. If you want to head to melodywilding.com slash quiz, you can find a quiz to rate yourself on those strive qualities we talked about today. So that may be a, a good resource for folks. Melody, thank you so much for your time today. It's been so educational for our listeners, so insightful. And again, your book, Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking and Channel Your Emotions for Success at Work is such a wonderful read and a resourceful read. Very easy, accessible, it's practical and your your writing style is very easy read. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Workplace Podcast with your host, William Corliss. Our special thanks to this episode's guest for sharing their expertise with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please download and share it. For updates on future episodes and to get in contact with us about any workplace topics, please follow Yellowwood on LinkedIn and Twitter at Different Paths. As always, you can head over to yellowwood.ie for any other information. Yellowwood, your external learning and development partner, provider of executive coaching, facilitation and training. Take a different path to success with your career, leadership, team and organization.